I said it right. That's right. <laughs> so we're glad to see you. We know some have texted me already, and they're watching from online because they're sick this morning. We have quite a few that are out, and we miss you all and look forward to you coming back soon. And um, so we want to have our show me prayer, and so I want to go ahead and explain that a little bit this morning. I try to do that every now and then. And so we pray this prayer out loud, and I, it's on the screen for those here, and it's in the description for those um, online. And <clears throat> take a picture of it or something, and we encourage you to pray this before you read your Bible or just whenever throughout the day. We pray it lots. And um, so I will say it, and then Jim will lead you guys in the repeat, and we say it out loud. All right? Lord Jesus. Lord Jesus. Show me what you want me to know. Show me what you want me to know. And Jesus, show me what you want me to do. And Jesus, show me what you want me to do. And Jesus, show me what you want me to stop doing. And Jesus, show me what you want me to stop doing. I will be a doer of your word. I will be a doer of your word. Not just a hearer. Not just a hearer. In Jesus' name I pray. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. I have to tell you something funny. When Michelle was standing up here with the cutest baby in the world, aren't all babies the cutest baby in the world? You know, they're a gift. Anyway, I saw her standing up here, and I pictured her 32 years ago standing like that with our baby on her hip. It was like instantaneous. It was like, is that her standing with Jimmy? Because she had a similar dress. She had about the same amount of hair. Actually, our child had no hair. And I think Michelle hot glued that thing to his head. <laughs> because she would knock it off. So hot glue works for a lot of stuff. I don't <laughs> Anyway, yeah. So uh, I uh, was listening to that Toby Mac and uh, Zach Williams song. And uh, I, as I tell you, I kind of investigate singers to see if they are who they portray themselves to be. And uh, I love Toby Mac, and I love Zach Williams. And I was watching this Toby Mac uh, uh, interview, and they said, so what do you think about Zach Williams? He goes, you know, the guy, I don't even know if you call it singing. It's like this thing that just comes out of him. It, it, I, he says, I can't do it. And when I hear people that can do it, I just go, i got to sing with them. And I thought that was funny. It's kind of like us, you know, when you get around somebody who's full of Jesus, then you just want to be around them. You either want to push them away or you want to be next to them. And uh, I, I love that. I love the, the camaraderie that that now 59-year-old guy, yeah, Toby Mac's 59. Yeah, and still runs around the stage like he's 30. Yeah, but anyway, uh, you just got to love that. Um, camaraderie he has and uh, what I love about Toby is he he em embodies trying to uh, live out the body of Christ there's all different kinds of beliefs within Christianity what does the church look like we look we're supposed to be known by our love for one another right and he embodies that I really like that so uh, I've got a interesting one today once again uh, God spoke to me um, on Tuesday with the verse of the day, and the verse of the day is 1 Peter chapter 2, I think it was verses 9 and 10, and I read that and I went, wait a minute, I've read this before, and it made me investigate where I originally heard it, which was in my daily Bible reading in Exodus about three weeks ago, and I, when I looked it up, I went, Oh, my gosh. And God goes, there you go. There's your next sermon. And so last week, we talked about justification. I, it's a weird thing. I'm doing my Emmaus, getting ready for my Emmaus talk right now. And, and when I do that, I have to relive my uh, testimony. Because when I do these talks, I have my testimony interwoven in it. And so my testimony... How would you say this? I'm going to try to explain something that's theological, and I don't really like theology in and of 
how we get hung up on that rather than just following Jesus. Yet the theology, the study of God, is important to do. Well, the Methodists, the way they do it is they break down grace into five areas. And one of the areas is provenient grace. One of the areas is justification. One of the areas is sanctification. And you go, wait a minute, I thought we were saved by grace. We are, but there's these different levels of it that you receive without knowing it. And I love how they break it down. It makes me study it. So provenient grace is before you ever knew God, he's actually chasing after you. He's actually enabling you for you to be able to even understand who he is. It's actually, if you want to look at it this way, it's the Holy Spirit before your salvation being all around you and trying to woo you to himself, right? Like, almost like dating. Hey, I got something for you and you're going to love it. You just got to trust me on this, right? What justification is, is our justifying grace is when I actually step into it. I actually receive it. And when you receive salvation, I don't know if you've ever think, thought about it, in some ways it's like a contract. He says, here it is, take it or leave it, and we say, I will thank you. You know that thank you is like signing on the dotted line. I receive it, right? So we thank him for it. And then uh, sanctifying grace is this thing where God then takes the justification and the prevenience, and then he goes, okay, now we're going to start to walk together. And here we go. You ready? One, two, three, go. And here we go. And that is a lifelong journey. And when Paul says, work out your salvation, that's exactly what he's talking about. Sanctification is working out your salvation. It's not working for your salvation. It's actually beginning to understand what it is and start to walk in it. And actually realize, like these cards I gave out last week, right? The I am statements. When the devil comes after you, the I am statements actually cause us to follow him better and they push the devil away. And the reason they do is because we recognize that once we've received him, he is with us. And the enemy likes to tell you he's not. But remember, he's a liar. Nothing comes through his mouth that's not a lie. Okay? A half-truth is a lie. Okay. So, now I say all of that to get us into the sermon. So the book of Exodus is a story of the Israelites coming out of Egyptian slavery and setting themselves apart with God as, his, as he now is their provider. He leads them off in the wilderness basically to sanctify them. He justified them when he pulled them out of Egypt and now he's sanctifying them. This is what I expect of you. Now when you read the book of Exodus, it can be pretty harsh because that's God unfiltered, right? You say, what do you mean by that? Well, have you ever met... Just a minute. Come here. Hey, don't be stealing his hug. I love you, man. It's been forever. Doing good. I know you are. Awesome. Matthew's a guy that's being sanctified. It took him a, a while to figure out he was justified. Now he's in the process of sanctified. <laughs> I'm going to take a segue, Matthew. This is a picture of all of this. I'll never forget... I don't know if you know this story or not, but I'll never forget that day. I was at 10 Star, and I brought your case up to the DA. And I said, hey, how do we really help this guy? Sending him to prison over and over and over ain't working. How do we really help this guy? He goes, well, you know, Jim, if you could vouch for him. I said, well, I can vouch for him, but that don't mean he's going to stay on the straight and narrow right? But I said, I do know this. I know his heart. See, that's what God does to us. He, he knows our heart because he created our heart. And when he created our heart, 
he put a little piece of himself in us to always draw us back to him. You ever thought about that? That's what happened with old Matthew. And once God got a hold of him, even though Matthew and Jim are similar, it's just that he went all the way to prison and I didn't. But we were just still just as enslaved by the sins. And we couldn't get out of it. But once we rested in the justification, what Jesus did for us, and said, thank you very much, the transaction is fulfilled, and then the Holy Spirit came in, then the sanctification process began. And so, it's the same thing with the Exodus. Is um, The children of Israel are justified through actually following Moses out into the wilderness. And then they're... In the process of being sanctified, the problem is is they don't really trust God. They trust Moses, sort of. But they say they trust him, but Moses is up on the Mount Sinai, and he's up there a little too long, and so they say, we got all these earrings that we got and nose rings that we got from the Egyptians. Let's throw it in the fire and see if a calf will jump out, right? So Moses, I'm not Moses, uh, Aaron makes this calf, and then God gets hacked and says, get down there and do something with them knuckleheads. And Moses goes down there and breaks the Ten Commandments that God had just written on. He scolds everybody, and then God says, you tell them who's going to stand with me and who ain't. And they all got on one side of the line or they were burned up. That's God unfiltered. See, when we stand before God unfiltered without somebody mediating between him and us it's harsh because he is the righteous judge and all of us are sinners and and we can't help it that's just what we are but then when the priest came along which is why they're they're trying to sanctify that's what God is trying to do with the children of Israel he says I'm going to set Aaron and his sons apart and they're going to mediate between me and the people that's what a priest is it's a mediator okay now watch this chapter 19 verse 3 then Moses climbed the mountain to appear before God the Lord called to him from the mountain and said give these instructions to the family of Jacob announce it to the descendants of Israel you have seen what I did in the with the Egyptians or to the Egyptians You know how I carried you on eagle's wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you will, listen to this, obey me and keep my covenant. See, God makes a covenant with them, and then he expects them to keep up their end of the deal. Keep my covenant. You will be my own special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth, for all the earth belongs to me. Let's not ever forget this. The devil may be the God of this world as in what we feel and what we see and what we know, but he is not the God of the planet. God created this planet for people, and it's for the people that it's, it's made for. God is the one in charge of that. But the air or the, how would you say it, the, uh, the systems are the devils because he took that from Adam when Adam sinned he took dominion now watch this but you are my special treasure from among all the peoples on the earth for all the earth belongs to me and you will be my kingdom of priest my holy nation this is the message you must give to the people of Israel so Moses returned from the mountain and called together the elders of the people and told them everything the Lord had commanded him And all the people responded together, we will do everything the Lord has commanded. So Moses brought the people's answer back to the Lord. That sounds good if that's the end of the story. But the problem is, a month later, they were complaining about everything. And they said, can you just let us go back to Egypt? How many of us, once we've got in it with the Lord a little bit, it gets a little hard because we got to give up some stuff, the stuff that's actually killing us, right? And we go, ah, oh, I just think I want to go back to being a drug addict. <laughs> or I want to go back to that wife-beating husband. Or I want to go back to the slavery I was ensnared in before, whatever that was. 
right? Why do we do that? Because it's actually comfortable because we know what that is. And we've been in it so long we can sort of deal with it. That's our logic. That's the devil's lie. Because the reality is, why did you choose Jesus if that's all good? See, it ain't good. When I medicated to regulate, I took some sort of illegal drug and put it in my system to try to feel whatever somebody else was feeling naturally. I'm so medicating myself, I'm not even me anymore. Right? That ain't living. Am I right? Can I get an amen? That ain't living. All right. So, if you obey me and keep my covenant, you will be my own special treasure. We agree. But then they turned their back on God within a month. And then every time they would do something else, God would go, that's it. Moses, I'm just going to use your offspring. We're going to start a new nation. And it was always funny because Moses would say, but God, the whole world knows you drug them out here to the wilderness. The whole world will see you annihilate them. And the whole world will go, why did he just take them out there to kill them? See, because God is a redeemer. He is a remodeler. He takes this crumpled up mess that we are and he turns us into something beautiful. And you go, well, sometimes I don't feel that. Well, do you think the daisy feels like it don't want to be a dandelion? You know, it, if the things of this planet did the way us humans would, nobody would be satisfied with anything that they've ever become, right? Give it opportunity. Let God justify you through coming to him and laying your burdens down at his feet, and then let him start the work. So you might go, okay, that's all interesting, Jim. So what's the point of this? Well, I've said for years and years and years, that if the children of Israel would have done what God asked them to do here, there would have actually been no need for Jesus to even come. Now, that's my own theory, but just think about it a minute. If they did what he actually told them to do, which is, I'm going to make you priest to the whole world, and everybody will come to you to find out who I am. But instead, what they did was they received it, and they went, okay, great. Those sorry good-for-nothing Philistines, those sorry good-for-nothing Syrians, those sorry good-for-nothing Babylonians, those sorry good-for-nothing. And they began to curse everybody. God had already decided that the judgment for the Canaanites was done because they would not repent for almost 800 years. He gave them 800 years to repent, and they wouldn't. He says, I want you to go in there and obliterate them. It's time for the land to be cleansed. That sounds harsh to us, but uh, God is a righteous judge, and he knows what he's doing. Amen. He gave those people 800 years to repent, right? But the children of Israel held it to themselves. So I ran across this TikTok this week, and I don't get TikTok except on my YouTube feed occasionally, something that I'm looking for, usually some sermon or something, and all of a sudden something will pop up. I want you to watch this. This is, a, this is a Muslim imam quoting the Quran and the book of Exodus out of the Torah. Watch this. You say you are a chosen people. I say, yes, you are a chosen people. You say it's in the Bible. I say it's also in the Quran. You are a chosen people. Chosen for what? You were chosen for a purpose. And that purpose mm. is spelled out for you in, in, in your Torah, in the Bible, in the second book of the Bible called Exodus. Now, therefore, if you Jews will obey my voice and keep my covenant, mm -hmm. then ye shall be a peculiar treasure unto me. If you okay. listen to God's voice, listen to his commandments, become right with him, he says, you will be a peculiar treasure unto me above all people. Quran says, yes. that I preferred you above all the peoples of the earth for my special favors. Mm -hmm. For all the earth is mine, says the Lord, and he shall be unto me a kingdom of priests 
and a holy nation. You are supposed to be a kingdom of priests, guide mankind to the knowledge of God. That, that was the role that why God chose you. You say you are a chosen That's people. Good. I say yes, you are. Did you hear that? Even the Arabs, through Muslim leadership, understands who the children of Israel were supposed to be. It goes back to this verse we just read. What happened? They kept it to themselves. Now, I thought it was interesting. Now, you might say, well, how did you come up with that, Jim? I've read the Bible through so many times, I now look at it many times as an overview. I can tell you the story of the book of, or the, I can tell you the story of the Old Testament in about a minute and a half, in an overview. I can tell you the story of the New Testament in about 30 seconds, in an overview. It's not hard once you read the whole book, right? And I'm not saying that to brag. I'm saying that to say God's message is simple. It's simple. Even a Muslim understood what the children of Israel were chosen for. And why do you think the Muslims have been led astray with the idea behind Allah, this ferocious, mean God, and if you don't obey him, you're going to hell, that's it. And, and it's unfiltered God again. It's Old Testament God. Why is that? Because they don't realize that he loves them. That's the whole point of Jesus, right? And he's actually saying, if you people would have done what you've done, we not, might not be in the mess we're in. He's saying the same thing I was saying. When I saw that, I went, isn't that interesting? Plus, he quoted the very same scripture that God had showed me. The sermon was going to be about today. So let me ask you a question. Is God in our midst speaking yes. through your pastor? And you guys are reading and listening to the word too, so you know what I'm saying is true. See, we're all in this together. The church actually is supposed to judge what the preacher says to make sure it's truth. Amen. That's the crazy part about this. It's reciprocal. We're all in this together. I'm not above you, you're not above me. The foot of the ground at the cross is equal, right? But now watch this. This is 1 Peter chapter 2. Peter is talking about the difference in justification and sanctification. He's saying now it's time for you guys to start following God. Watch this. So get rid of all evil behavior. This is verse 1 of chapter 2 of 1 Peter. Be done with all deceit, hypocrisy, jealousy, and all unkind speech. Like newborn babies, you must crave pure spiritual milk so that you will grow into a full experience of salvation. Cry out for this nourishment now that you have had a taste of the Lord's kindness. You are coming to Christ who is the living cornerstone of God's temple. Past, present, future. He was rejected by people, but he was chosen by God for great honor. And you are living stones that God is building in his spiritual temple. What's more, you are his holy priests. What? That sounds familiar. Through the mediation of Jesus Christ, you offer spiritual sacrifices that please God. As the scriptures say, I am placing a cornerstone in Jerusalem chosen for great honor. And anyone who trusts in him will never be decreased. Disgrace. Yes, you who trust him recognize the honor God has given him, but for those who reject him, the stone that the builders rejected has now become the cornerstone. He is the stone that makes people stumble, the rock that makes them fail. I can talk about God all day long, and people will go, yeah, yeah, because everybody's got a God, right? But the minute I mention Jesus, whole nother level of something. People usually, if you're in crowds like I've been in occasionally, especially when I go to Seattle or Portland, and you mention Jesus, oh, the reaction is like, <sighs> why? They've just been confronted with their sin. It, it's not me. I just said the name of Jesus. But what does the Bible say about Jesus? In Jesus' name, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. You're... you're <laughs> You're not going to get out of this judgment at the end unless Jesus is your defense attorney. It's that simple. And the fun part of that whole story, he knows the judge. In fact, he eats with him on a regular basis. Now, what about this cornerstone? 
I like to use our wall a lot. This wall is, this wall right here is about 130 years old, going back to that seam, because that's the old Ardmorite building. And in 1916, I believe it was, we had a ammonia car blow up down there, killed several people, but it burned the whole downtown. And so that wall is original, and the wall on the other side of that is not original. So when they built this building, they sistered onto it with these columns, and then they, pour, they built a brick wall out front, and then they poured concrete over the windows, and then they set these handmade trusses up here. And so everything is held on these piers and the front wall, but those piers are no good without the wall. And you might go, okay, Jim, fine, I understand. Well, that's a foot thick brick wall, which means those bricks are, many of those bricks that you see every two feet, every two and a half feet, there's a course that runs this way, not this way. That's to tie the other two layers of brick together. And to build a building like this out of brick would take about a month in that day, just the walls, because you're laying, you're laying close to probably a half a million bricks, right? Now, when you think about that, you go, well, how do they start? Well, they start like this. They dig a ditch. They put steel in it. They have batter boards sitting at each end, which are just boards that sit here like this at each end. You put a string line on it, and you decide where the ditch needs to be. And then you use that same string line, once you pour the concrete in it, to determine where the wall is going to go and which side of the wall we're starting on. And then you take a brick, you slather mud on it, and you stick it down on the ground, you line it up with that brick, and then you take another brick and you do it like, they're like this, you've got a corner. Now everything comes off of that. The building is not built without the cornerstone. Now in this case, it's a brick wall, so it's not a stone. Now if you go to the western wall in, uh, on the Temple Mount, those are half-ton limestone blocks that are laid just like bricks. And that first one, those first two actually, are the exact same thing as these bricks I was just, the building don't get built without the cornerstone. So Christ Church is built from him starting the cornerstone and then we are the bricks. In fact, we are the priests and we're all priests, not me. Not the priest at, you know, the Catholic Church. We're all priests. So watch this. They stumble because they do not know God's word, and so they meet the faith that was planned for them. So did God plan on killing anybody that didn't believe in him? No. He sent Jesus so nobody had to die. But we choose our own destiny when we don't listen to God. I've said this for years. I've worked multiple big projects in my life. And one time I was doing this hotel, and uh, I asked my boss, I said, my boss, it was the construction owner, I said, can I build a whole hotel? I'm going to hire six guys, and we're going to build a whole thing ourselves. We're going to do everything. And he goes, really? I said, yeah, I want to do it. It's one of those things I want to Take off my list that I built a building that size. It was 84 rooms. A huge hotel. Three-story hotel. And it was all metal studs, which makes it trickier. And we did it. But one day, one day, I told them on the front end, these other six guys I hired, I said, listen, I know exactly how to do this. Three of you have done this with me before, so you know exactly what you're doing. But I'm going to tell you, I don't fire anybody. Your behavior fires you. And we're in here entering into an agreement right now. If you don't show up, you're done. If you don't do this, you're done. If you don't do this, you're done. And they go, that's harsh. I'm going, there's seven of us building this building that ought to take 50 guys. There's no room for error. You understand? And one day we're setting the trusses. We've got this, what is it, $10,000 an hour? crane out there, right? And he's setting all in these metal trusses that are 65 feet long and they are 40 feet tall and they're like a sail in the wind. We picked a non-windy day. One of the guys got scared. He was the tagline guy having to walk through the studs. 
making sure he's hanging on to it so it don't just sail. We go to set it down, and something scared him, and when he did, he just walked off the job. $10,000 an hour crane sitting there. We're only a third of the way done. And I went, where did he go? He left. All right. You all get double pay today. Let's go. We just kept rolling. A guy shows up the next day. Man, I'm, I'm sorry. I got scared and I walked off. I said, well, what are you doing here? He goes, well, I wanted to see if you'd give me another chance. I said, no. You fired yourself yesterday and you put all of us in danger. And as you can see, even if we were afraid, we worked through the fear. You chose this. Well, that's what it's going to be at the end. It's going to be just like that. See? These people chose not to follow Christ because they let him become a stumbling block to them rather than listening to him. Understood? But you are not like that, for you are a chosen people. You are royal priest, a holy priest, a holy nation, God's very own possession. This is Exodus 19. Only this is the uneducated fisherman telling us this. What's happened to the uneducated fisherman? He's been educated through the power of the Holy Spirit. He now connects the dots to everything in the Old Testament and writes them down in the New Testament. See, what I love about Peter is Peter is just like us. We're all working class people. None of us have inherited enough money to where we never had to work. Every one of us in here have had to work in our life. That's Peter. And Peter gets this. But you are not like that. You are a chosen people. You are royal priests, a holy nation, God's very own possession. As a result, you can now show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of the darkness into his wonderful light. So how do we do that? Tell your story. It's called a testimony. The mystery of God's plan is you, and he integrates it into his story called history. It works in English. It doesn't work in every other language. <laughs> and you've got to get kind of, you know, real loose with mystery, but it still works. So why am I saying it like that? We are those bricks, and each one of those bricks are built off of the cornerstone, which is the priest, and now we all become priests through the power of the Holy Spirit. Look at the equality in that. You know, you know we see this DEI stuff all the time. You talk about equity. God says all of us are equal. It doesn't matter what race we are. It doesn't matter what we look like. It doesn't matter what our status is. We're all equal, and every one of those bricks make the building of Christ. Isn't that ridiculous? And you start taking pieces away, it weakens the wall. Right? Did you ever read the story of um, Nehemiah when he's building the walls? And it said they had a sword in one hand and a trowel in the other. See, we don't want to fight the battle like that. We want to be together, all part of the building and that building is called a church, and it's not a church building. We are the church. We're the bricks. We're the stones, right? All right. Once you had no identity as a people, identity in Christ, once you had, a, had no identity as a people, now you are God's people. Once you received no mercy, now you have received God's mercy. Hey, Big Chris, do you mind getting that ready? We're going to baptize Dear friends, I am warning you, or I warn you as temporary residents and foreigners to keep away from the worldly desires that wage war against your very souls. Be careful to live properly among your unbelieving neighbors. Then even if they accuse you of doing wrong, they will see your honorable behavior and they will give honor to God when he judges the world. You know what this is saying right here? You're actually a form of a mediator between the world and God. You're a picture of what Christ is doing in your life, and people see that, and they're drawn to it. Right? 
And I'm not saying you've got to be perfect. What I love is, is that every person in the Bible is a mess. Every one of them. You know, some people, I, for years I went, well, you know, Daniel doesn't really seem like a mess. Yeah, he had some arrogance going on. And you go, well, why is that? Because he writes the book of Daniel and he only uses his Hebrew name the whole time, yet he goes by the name of the Babylonian names of his friends. Just think about that. Hananiah, Azariah, Mishael. That's Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego's real names. There, Daniel's writing the book. Well, I'm Daniel. They're just Babylonian boys. No, they're not. They're Hebrews. What are you doing? And what about Joseph? Joseph looks like he don't have any problems. Looks like he does pretty good, right? Even though he spent 20 years in prison for something he didn't do. But Joseph had his own things going on when his dad went to bless Manasseh and Ephraim and he switched their hands. Uh, Joseph goes, don't do that, don't do that. And, jo and Jacob says, I did what I did and that's the way it's supposed to be. See, because God, even though we're a, we're a group of firstborns, <laughs> when you look at the way the lineages go, we're actually not firstborns. But God, in Jesus' story, uses second-born children all the time because the firstborn already got their own responsibilities. But then he turns us into firstborns because in Exodus, the firstborns had to be bought back from God because they were all his. <laughs> We've been bought back, so we're all firstborns. I mean, we, the levels of depths of this, by the time you get Exodus, Leviticus, now, I'm going to tell you, the first time you read it through, you're going to go, this is boring. But once you study Exodus and Leviticus a few times, you go, oh, my gosh, the depths of pictures of Jesus and God's love is ridiculous. Right? So why am I telling you all this? Because it's time for many of us in this room to step up and be counted as sanctified Christians the ones who are being set apart for a work. The reason I say that is because it's real easy to be like a sponge and just soak it all in. But you know, if you take a sponge that you clean dishes with and you wring it out and then you fill it up because it's fresh water, it's rinsed out now, and you just throw it under the sink, what happens? It molds. We do the same thing in the church when we don't take on our responsibility for Christ. We may have all the goodness of God, and we may have our salvation, and it's for sure, and I'm in it, and I love it, but then we don't tell nobody, and we get moldy, and then we get complacent, and then we go, I just don't know if they'll miss me if I come to church. You know when we're going to miss you is when you're a worker. And I'm not talking about doing things around the church. It's you're bringing somebody to Jesus on a regular basis. Yeah. Now, if you're, if you're not like me and you're not an extrovert, I can dig that. But here's the deal. If you're an introvert, you're assigned one person to tell. You ain't getting out of this. <laughs> you're assigned one person, and every introvert's got one friend. Yeah. Am I right or am I wrong? Hey, right. No man is an island. No woman is an island either, or an island, or an isle. <laughs> anyway, so the point is, what are you going to do with, God, with what God has given you? I noticed this morning, after reading through this a couple more times, I went, oh my gosh, I breathe in and out mercy with every breath. I breathe out mercy. I breathe in mercy. God has been merciful to me. It's in the air I breathe, right? I walk in it. When I sin after being a Christian, I'm walking in mercy. Because if it was God unfiltered, hey, somebody get this guy, get Jim Yeager and put him against that wall and stone him. He crossed the line. No, mercy goes, no, come on, come on, repent. People ask me all the time, well, how do I do that? It's simple. God, I did that. You know I did it. I own it. I apologize. Help me not to do that again. 
and then get back in it. Don't grovel and cry and get on the ground and get in the mud. No, I'm throw ashes on your head. No, I'm all that. No, stop. Get up, right? Just get up. Face the Lord again. Get back in the game and let's go. I want you to be thinking about that as we go into this time of reflection. If you need to first be justified because if you're here and you've already been feeling the tug of God, provenient grace has already been working on you. But if you're here and you go, man, today's the day. Let's get justified before God so we can stand before God. And then we'll work on the sanctification. But you guys that already got justified, let's get in the sanctification. Let's get in whatever it is that God's calling you to do.